Hey guys, good evening to you. It is Sits 51 on this March 11th. And we are going to redo Lent Week 4 tonight. But before we do so, I'm going to read you the story of Wonka. It's based on the 2023 film. And I'm going to read this to you. Some children are born to be chocolate makers. This was certainly true of Willy Wonka. Yet for a long time, no one would have thought it. For starters, he almost never ate chocolate. In fact, he ate only one bar a year. One day, he would grow up to live in the world's biggest chocolate factory. But as a young boy, Willy Wonka lived on the world's smallest boat. It was an old narrow boat with a tiller pan and multicolored stripes and a cozy cabin with hand-swung curtains hand-sewn curtains. Inside, there was just a single bed with a soft knitted blanket where Willie slept, an armchair where his mother slept, a stove, and a kitchen filled with broken covers and a warm and a worm-eaten dining table. The woodworms ate more at the table than the Wonkas ever did. Everything at the beginning of this story is small. The small boy, the small quantity of chocolate, the small boat, and the small family who lived about it. Willy Wonka's family was almost as small as a family could be. There was Willy, of course, and his mother. They moored their small boat, boat on a quiet stretch of the river, as not many people from town ventured there. They often had the lush riverbank all to themselves. It was one of Willy's favorite places. There was tall grass for lazing in, sprinkled with buttercups and rhododendrons, flower running colors of pink and mauve and red. Willie's favorite part was the gigantic willow tree, with its thick branches that swooped low over the boat before dipping into the river. He thought of the tree as another member of the family, a twiggy old protector of their small but grand life. Not many people would see their life as grand, of course, but Willie Wonka did. He could see what others couldn't because he had the most wonderful imagination. Willie's imagination would one day become an F, as famous as his chocolate, but before it belonged to the world, it was small and new and belonged only to him. His mother was the one who nurtured it, letting it grow wild so it could spin off into places no imagination had been before. And then there was the chocolate, the one bar. It wasn't much, but it was enough because it was the best bar in the world. His mother would make it for his birthday, and as the special day approached, he would feel the excitement bubbling up in him until he thought he might burst. The chocolate-making ritual was always the same. His mother would tip a bag of cocoa beans under the table and carefully count them out. He'd watch her pluck them from the table one by one, and his mouth would begin to water. It took her all year to save up enough money to buy the right amount for one bar. And he could tell she was excited about making it for him as he was about eating it. When the calendar stage was finished, she'd throw the beans in the pot and begin crushing and whipping and stirring, and the whole room would be engulfed in a chocolatey steam. It was so thick and delicious, it felt like being swept up in the most scrumptious cloud. Oh, how he loved to watch her stir that thick, bowling mixture. As his mother made magic, Willie took long sniffs of the rich, heavy smell and knew there would be no adventure in the world that he had loved more than watching his mama make chocolate. Soon, the delicious bar of chocolate would be waiting for him on the table, and he spent the rest of the day walking around with, melted, with a melted chocolate mustache with a big grin. It was like that every year, and it was perfect. You know, Mama, he said one year as they huddled around the table making chocolate, I bet you make the best chocolate in the whole world. I'd taste all the chocolate ever existed just to prove it. Do you know where they say the very best chocolate in the world comes from? She replied, looking around as if she was ready to tell a great secret. The Galleries Gourmet, that's where the finest chocolate makers have their shops. Theirs can't be better than yours, Mama, Willie said. It's impossible. She smiled. Why, as it so happens, I do have a little secret that even those fancy pants don't know. What is it? Willie asked, edging closer. He wanted to know the secret more than he'd ever wanted to know anything in his whole life. I'll tell you one day. She said, now while the chocolate set, would you like to open your present? We should go, Mama, he cried suddenly, making her jump. Where's that then? To the gallery's gourmet, he said, practically bouncing on the spot. We could start a shop. She raised a curious eyebrow. 
What? Us? Yes, with our name above the door and everything. Wonka, everyone in the world would want our chocolate. Think how happy we can make people. His mother brushed some chocolate dust from her apron and smiled. Oh, I can see it now. A fine shop. Tables piled high with chocolate. Willie's eye grew red as the plate materialized in his mind. And the tables would be made of chocolate. The whole shop would be made of chocolate. Would be made of chocolate. His mother beamed. What a wonderful dream, Willie. He slumped. Is that all it is? Just a dream? Hey now, she said. Every good thing in this world started with a dream. So you hold on to yours. And when you do share your talk with the world, I'll be right there beside you. You promise, he whispered. I pinky you promise, she said with a smile. And that's the most solemn vow there is. Then she took a piece of paper, which she set aside to wrap the chocolate, and wrote Wonka across it, adding a swish and a swirl to the W and carefully coloring it in. Once she finished, she handed Willie something wrapped in an old newspaper. Your present, she said. The magician in town was selling it. Did me a good deal. Willie beamed and began ripping the package open, his fingers working fast to tear the inky paper. Inside, he found a new coat. He pulled it on. His hand barely went past the elbows. You'll grow into it, his mother said. One day you will. And all the adventures you'll have in it. The coat came with a tall hat. Slowly he placed it on his head and rose to his feet. His mother handed him his chocolate, small and still warm. He cradled it in his hands like the most precious prize. Mustn't forget the most delicious bit, she said with a wink. He beamed at her, and then he slipped the bar into his pocket. There he was, Willy Wonka in his plum clear tailcoat and fine top hat. Chapter 1 City of Dreams, seven years later. Willie stood on the deck of an old fishing ship, cloaked in mist and smiling brightly. All around him, the weather-worn crew was busy busying themselves on deck, and young Mr. Wonka couldn't have looked more out of place in his bright green waistcoat and multicolored scarf. Seven years I've been at sea, he said to a nearby fisherman who was scrubbing a crate and barely listening. But now it's time for a new adventure. My next stuff is almost upon us. Oh, really? the fisherman said. Everyone on board had grown quite used to Willie's strange tales and flights of fancy by now. Every minute the waves lapped me closer to my dream, Willie said grandly. Where's that then? the fisherman asked. Willie grinned and pointed to the horizon. There, glistening brightly in the winter sun, was the city he had pinned all his hopes on. It looked even more marvelous than he had imagined, sprawling and grand, and he took a small sniff. The smell was the best part of all. The whole place, even from afar, smelled of chocolate. Oh, it was heavenly, even when mingled with a set of barrels full of fish. He pulled a small old chocolate bar from his pocket. The mateship wrapper was faded now, but his mother's writing still remained to say he traced his fingers over the swirly letters. A harbor bell sounded in the distance. Land ahoy, Willie cried. They won't know what hit him, Mr. Wonka, the fisherman said with a chuckle, and he off to rent the boat to duck. Willie took one last great bit sniff of the chocolate of the air before trying inside to the engine room. There he scooped up his trusty plum-colored tailcoat and top hat, a battered cage and a fine item he had acquired on his travels, a long cane with a sparkling gold tip. He was giddy with anticipation as he absentmindedly put his hat on, took it off, touched it under his arm, then lifted his cane and put it over his shoulders before putting it down again. It was as if the excitement had so overwhelmed him that he'd forgotten where our hat went and how to carry a cane. A polite cough made him jump, and he spun on his heel to see the kindly eyes of the ship's captain staring back at him. He was a tall man with a beard as long as his years at sea, which is as long as it takes hair to grow to your knees. Here, the captain said, holding out a weathered fist and opening it to reveal a bag of coins. Willie peeked inside. Twelve silver sovereigns, he cried in amazement. It was more money than he had ever held in his hand before, and he thought he might collapse under the sheer weight of such a generous lump sum. Your wages, plus a little extra for all those delicious chocolates you made for us, the captain said. We all put in as much as we could, and it's not much. Not for the big city, but I hope it'll start you off right. Good luck to you, lad. The boat jolted and groaned as they made contact with the duck, and Willie pulled his top head down firmly on his head 
today. Thank you, Captain, he said, the nerves now rising in him like a fast tide. A crate was being crammed out of the hole, and Willie jumped onto it, and up he went, leaving the amused Captain in his wake. You could use the game plan of Fisherman holding a game plan shot as Willie shot a passage. If you, if you give me a second, I haven't a second to lose, Willie called down to him. He pushes the crane, winched the crate higher and swung it around the duck. Then he spread his arm wide and cried, say, Today is the day, the day the world meets my chocolate. Instantly, someone shouted, Is there a person on that crate? There was a switch of metal and the crane came to an abrupt halt. The crane's operator stuck its head out of the control cabin and locked eyes with Willie. You can't stay on a crane, he cried incredulously. Get off. If you insist, sir, Willie said. Then much to the astonishment of the crowd watching on the duck, he died right off it head first. There was a collective holding of breath as Willie somersaulted down to the sound of nothing but the wind and his own thumping heartbeat. It may have looked impressive, but Willie hadn't really thought it through and was wide-eyed with fear as his face led the way to the pavement. Luckily, there was a truck passing at just the right time to catch him. Otherwise, this story would be very short indeed. On to my dreams, Willie cheered as he flipped and landed perfectly upright on the roof of the truck. It trailed off through, through, toward the town, leaving the crowd gaping jaws behind him. The truck sped over a grand stone bridge, doted with Mormon lanterns, and all the way into the heart of the city which is better than anything Willy Wonka had Im imagined. It was dusted like a donut in fresh snow, and perfect in every way. There were intriguing cobblestone alleys peppered with shots painted in the prettiest of blues, and paints and purples that went left and right and right and left, just like a rabbit warren. And the smell! The closer they got to the center of town, the more it intensified, and Willie couldn't help but sigh with delight. The truck passed through the town square, and he took his chance grabbing hold of a lamppost, and swam round as he watched the vehicle speed off, leaving nothing but air beneath his feet. The place was so packed to burst it, and not a single soul had spotted him. High up on the lamppost, and he slid down, landing among a sea of potential customers. He'd never been somewhere so busy or so loud. He found himself trying to gulp it all in, his eyes darting left, right, up and down, and every angle in between all at once. On one side of the square was an imposing cathedral with possibly tall oak doors and a roof so high it looked like it might be attached to heaven. There were shops on every corner with windows crammed with perfumes and shoes, butts and paints, and food carts, were, food carts rolled back and forth nearly knocking him sideways. The square was lined with decadent columns and the, and the center was marked with an ordinate fountain frozen solid in the cold. It twinkled in the sunlight like it was filled with stars pulled from the sky. The whole place was impossibly beautiful, but the most beautiful building of, of all was the gallery's go merry. Willie stopped when he caught in his sights its dawn glinting in its doors, a shivering in white and blue. It smells nothing but pure chocolate. Wow, he whispered as he stared his dream in the face. He felt light and tingly and smiled a dozy smile. He waited his whole life to see it, and finally here he, restaurant map, sir? A man shouted in his ear, sharing his thoughts. Willie handed the man a sovereign, and in turn, the man get, gave him a map. This will show you the best restaurant, the man said, noticing Willie's state. Willie's stare was still fits on the galleries going May. He added, you can't only eat chocolate after all. Oh, of course not, Willie agreed. You must also have sweets. He unfolded the map to give it a quick look, but as he did so, he spied someone crouching at his feet. A young boy was waving a rag about and polishing his shoes. Er, excuse me, Willie said. Yes, yes, almost finished, the boy replied. He took out a big buffing pad and began running it over the toe. Right done, he said, and held out a hand for payment. Willie was racking his brains, trying to remember it, and all the excitement he had the reins to have his shoes cleaned. He handed the boy one of his sirens in any case and counted the ones that remained. Oh dear, I'm already down to ten sirens, he said. At that moment, a fruit cart trundled past, and Willie plucked a pumpkin from it and gave it a good snap. But before he had a chance to put it back, a cyclist shot past, clipping his ankles, and the pumpkin slipped from his grasp. It splattered on his boots. The fruit cellar loomed over him, eyeing the pile of mulch on the pavement. That's three sirens, mate. Three? That's a rather extreme price for a vegetable, Willie said with a charming smile. 
The seller was gravely serious. You broke my pumpkin. You paid for it. She snapped, making Willie jump so suddenly the three sirens leaped from his head and into the outstretched palm of the seller. Pleasure doing business with you, she said. Willie began counting his remaining coins. I got five, six, seven. He felt seven. He felt a proud on his shoe. That shoe, son, the shoe shine boy was back again. He wiped the pumpkin sludge off and held out a hand for payment. Six silver solids. Willie groaned as he gave the boy another coin and then made for the gallery going. Where's your coat, sir? The shoe shine boy asked as he hurried after. Willie quickened his pace. No, thank you. The boy darted in front of him and held up a chipped old bun. Clone? Absolutely not. I only fragrance myself with chocolate, Willie said, leaving the boy blinking with confusion behind him. Absolute. Porters threw open the doors and announced grandly, Welcome, sir, to the Gallery's Gourmet. At this point, the sweetest, most delicious aroma flooded the streets, and Willie was almost not sideways by the scrumptiousness of it all. He stood staring at what lay behind. Beyond, it wasn't just an arcade full of shops to him. It was his dreams piled high in stone and glass. He closed his eyes and touched the pocket where he kept his mother's bar of chocolate. Here we go, Ma, he whispered, and with a brave steady entered. Inside the place had the aroma of dreams and chocolate. With a hint of opportunity and a dash of, he clipped his fingers looking for the word shoe polish. His eyes snapped open and shot to his shoes, where once again the shoe sign boy was raised. Well, no, Willie said firmly. No more shoe sign, thank you very much. He marched out, and the boy scurried off in search of some other shoes. The arcade was spectacular and lofty, with a lattice ceiling that perfectly framed the winter sky. But Willie soon realized that it was grand in the way grand things tend to be when dreamed up by someone who doesn't do much dreaming. He spent some marble walls, a mosaic floor, gold fittings. As he walked, Willie redecorated it in his mind. Caramel walls? No, that's not quite right. Scratch and sniff walls? Yes. An edible grass floor? Lollipop door handles? He stopped when he reached a fusty shop with a, que with a queue out of the door. The chocolates in the window were laid out in unimaginative rows all shaped the same and stamped with a name Willie knew immediately. It was the name of one of the most famous chocolate makers in the world, Slugworth. Every box was filled with the same flavor of chocolate. Willie, Willie couldn't help noticing plain, plain, and more plain. Next to Slugworth's shop stood two equally fusty shops, owned by the other two famous names in chocolate made, Fickle Grover and Proud Notes. But next to them stood an empty shop. An empty shot with a sign that read, For Rent. Willie stepped toward it, slowly unable to believe his eyes. It was all chip paint and thick dust. It was a mess of a shop. It was perfect. He could imagine what it would be like to sell alongside the others, with four of them all standing together, a rush of customers, a sea of chocolate-smeared faces and whoops and cheers of sheer delight. Four great chocolatiers and four great friends. Side by side, he touched the chocolate bar in his pocket again, and suddenly Wonka appeared in his mother's rain above the empty shop door. The newspapers plastered over the windows peeled back like curtains to reveal a mountain of chocolates and sweets inside, his chocolates and sweets, wild and weird and crab-pleasingly wonderful. He took off his hat, pulled the chocolate from it, and handed it to a passerby. They scarfed the chocolate, and instantly their toes began to tap. Slowly at first, then faster, until they were dancing with gusto. Then another person grabbed the chocolate and joined in. Then another, and another, until everyone was trolling around. Willie began to dance, too. All around, around him, customers were gulping down fistfuls of chocolates and laughing and spinning and keeping their lights up in the air. Willie stood in the middle, marveling at the magic of the 
They loved his chocolates. It was his destiny. He had arrived. They really, really loved. Ahem. <clears throat> Came a cough. And Willie felt a firm tap on his shoulder. Immediately, the shop melted back to its empty, old, run-down state. The people he had imagined dancing were just shuffling past. One was even picking their nose. Willie turned and was surprised to see it was a policeman who had tapped on his shoulder. He was a young man with bright eyes and the strained face of someone who was trying hard to be tougher than he was. He pointed to his son in the corner of the arcade. No daydreaming. I'm afraid you'll have to leave, he said, gesturing to the door. I saw you daydreaming, jumping about, pulling air out of your hat, and trying to hand it to that man, picking his nose. No daydreaming? Really? Willie said with sincere confusion. It's very unfortunate, because that's what I spend most of my time doing. He laughed. But the policeman did it. He said he held up his hand, and it's a three sovereign fun. Three? Goodness, Willie said. Rummaging around his pocket for the coins, he had handed them over. Still confused, he turned to leave and was met with a spray of cologne right in the face. The shoeshine boy smiled and held out his hand. No, I'm not paying you, Willie said. Not this time. The policeman raised an eyebrow. You will pay the boy, he ordered, as the lad raised his hand higher, unless you can find a way to get back that clone. He can't, the boy said gleefully. I bet it's really shoved into his eyebrows by now. Willie reluctantly handed over another siren, his fingers lingering on the cold coin as the boy pried it from his grasp. Then he made his way slowly to the exit, the usual spring in his step, in place with a disappointed shuffle. He made for the city's riverbank. A good river always made him feel at home, but he was freezing and the cold was biting. As cheats, the city's colder than I thought it would be and much more expensive. I can't even make a dozen silver sirens last more than one day, he muttered to himself. Just then, he saw a young mother and her child shivering under the bridge. Could you spare a sovereign for a place to sleep? She asked. Oh, of course, Willie said, holding out what remained of his coins. Please, take whatever you need. She took his silver sovereign from his hand, leaving them with just one left. He flipped his last sovereign into the air and caught it in his coat pocket. Immediately, there was a clang, and he looked down to see the coin had fallen through a hole. His final sovereign had bounced off his boot and rolled away down a drain. He frowned. Well, there goes the hotel. Chapter 2. Scrub it in Bleacher. Willie lay shivering on a park bench, too cold to sleep. He placed his top hat over his face, but even that was enough to stop his nose from icing over. He was staring into the dark, empty abyss of the inside of his hat, dreaming of ways to get his shot, when he heard a knock. Not just one, three deliberate knocks. He pulled a lever attached to the rim, and the top of his hat flipped open to reveal a stocky, broken tooth man standing over him. Woof, and an equally shocking but excellently toothed dog. You all right there? The man asked. F -f 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 Fine, thank you. Willie managed a little colder than I expected. You must be new in town, he said. I'm Bleacher, and this dog here is Tittles. Willie Wonka, I just arrived and began to wish I'd come in the height of summer. This is the height of summer, Bleacher said, laughing. You're not planning to sleep there, are you? Unfortunately, Willie attempted a big frown, but his face was too frozen for it. I seem to have lost what little money I had. I was planning on sleeping in a nice, warm hotel. Ah, the man said. Well, as luck would have it, I know someone who can help you. Really, Willie said, his mood immediately warming. Yeah, Bleacher said. Come with me. Willie unstuck himself from the frozen bench and shuffled after Bleacher, who was already taking bed stocking strides ahead. Thank you, Willie said, hurrying to catch up. Thank you hugely, sir. Bleacher grinned. Don't mention it. Tillis and I are always on the lookout for a stranger in need, aren't we, boy? Tillis growled, and Willie clutched his case tight. It's not far, Bleacher said, and he glanced back at Willie. Right behind you, Willie said, and a thawing... Beautifully with the, with this brisk white. Bleacher grinned. Good. What luck, Willie marveled. I'm so glad to have met you. Me too, 
Police were saying the voice so close to a growl the dog could have said it. Me too. Police were led Willie through the cobbled alleyways all the way to the outskirts of the city. They watched in silence and soon the roar and rumble of the city faded into the dark until all that could be heard was the sound of their echoing footsteps with the occasional growl from the dog. Sorry about Tails, by the way. Bleacher eventually piped up. He seems to have taken a likely to your bat side. Willie tapped his chin and thought, You know, I bet it's not my bomb. It'll be my trousers. They're vintage, actually. I got them from a postman. Funny fellow, aren't you? Bleacher said. That'll be a Tails will spend all day running after postman because, wouldn't you, boy? The dog gave a grunt that sounded surprisingly like a gruff, Yes! <clears throat> Bleacher halted and pointed ahead down the dark alleyway. Well, there it is, Mr. Wonka. Home sweet home. Up ahead was a crumbling building. It was tall, about five stories high, and with every floor, Willie's eye traveled up, up. The place got more and more lopsided. At the very top, John up from the side, was an old wooden bird coop alive with pigeons cooing highly in the silence. Willie's eyes followed the building down, past window frames that had popped out and were hanging there like glassy bats. Some of the windows were barred, and the ground floor window was shuttered for the night. Scrubbing in bleachers, guest out and laundry, Bleacher boomed as they reached the door. Bleacher, Willie said, it's you. It's mostly her, Bleacher said, putting a, pulling a bell. Before the bell had even finished in, a harsh, gray voice sounded from behind the door. If that's you, Bleacher, you better have that warm water. Oh, I've got something better for Better than warm wire, Mrs. Scrubbit. I've got a guest. There was a clink and a clunk, and a slot in the door opened to reveal a roving eye. Willie beamed, and the eye widened hungrily. What a charming greeting, Willie said sincerely as the door was thrust open, revealing a squat woman with slick back hair. For someone whose job it was to make things clean, she was surprisingly greasy. Her teeth were covered in the gray sludge, and as she smiled, Willie was sure he saw something slimy or slither between them. Come on in, sir, she said as Willie tripped his hat to her and stepped inside. The place was a mess. Bundles of smelly clothes lie on rickety shelves collapsing under the weight of so much washing. The only light, a spider-like chandelier, was dim and dusty and flickered as Willie moved around the room. He spied a dumbwaiter in the wall, a small elevator-like contraption to carry the washing down to the wash house. He peeked down the shaft, but could see nothing but darkness. Welcome to Scrubbit and Bleacher's Guest Town and Laundry, but I'm Mrs. Scrubbit, the big boss. Make yourself at home, warm your cockles by the warm by the fire. Worm water? Oh, Willie began, but Mrs. Scrubbit interrupted him. Noodle! She screeched. Immediately, a sudden and scholarly little serving girl came sliding into the room. She was holding a book in her hand and snapped it shut as she skidded to a hall in front of them. Willie offered her a smile, but she snapped her head away to avoid his gaze almost as quickly as she had closed her book. Put that silly book away and fetch her guess a glass of warm wire, Mrs. Scrubbit Bloom. Poor man's frozen half to death. Doodle turned her back to them and immediately began busying herself, raising a glass here and uncoring the bottle there. As soon as the cork came out, the most putrid smell filled the room storing up. Willie's nose had sticking into the back of his throat. It smelled like someone had taken a swamp full of dead things and added mustard and vinegar to it. He began to gag, but much to his surprise, Mrs. Scrubber was taking a great bit sniff and ooh and on ah as if it smelled utterly wonderful. Noodle pressed a glass of gloopy gray sludge into Willie's hand and fixed him with an apologetic stare. Warm wire, Mrs. Scrubber said. There's nothing more glorious. Thank you, Willie said with a gulp. He thought he spotted something slithering through the gloop. You and your husband have been most kind to me. Husband, Mrs. Scrubbit spat. She turned to Bleacher. Oh, you liked that, wouldn't you? No, Bleacher lied. I'm holding out for someone better, Mrs. Scrubbit explained. A marquee, or maybe a print. She stopped across the room and nudged the glass of warm water closer to Willie's lip. Drink up. They both drank, and Willie and Mealy got... <gasps> That's an extremely powerful. That's extremely powerful stuff. He managed as something definitely alive slid down his throat. Mrs. Scrubbit let some stingy gray bits from the corners of her mouth, making a horrible slurping sound between the munching and squelching. 
When she finally gulped down the last drop and licked the glass for good measure, she said, Now, Mr. Wonka, what can I do for you? A room, is it? Well, yes, but er, will he pause feeling embarrassed? Mrs. Scrubber flashed bleacher smoke. You don't say, Mr. Wonka. I'm afraid it's true, Mrs. Scrubber, Willie said. I am not a sovereign in my name, but if my protagonations are correct, all that's about to change. Oh, yeah, Mrs. Scrubber said. See, I'm something of a magician, inventor, and chocolate maker. Spent the past seven years traveling the world, perfect in my craft. And first thing tomorrow, at the Galleries Gourmet, I plan to unveil my most astonishing creation yet. Prepared to be amazed, as I present you, he reached into his hat and pulled out. A teapot, Mrs. Scrubbin said flatly. Huh? Well, he said before noticing that he indeed pulled a teapot from it. Oh, no, it's not that. They were invented ages ago, mate, Bleacher said. Willie put the teapot back and started rummaging through his hat again. The others stared as he pulled out a strand of handkerchief, a bunch of carrots somewhere inside the hat, an angry nay, he said. Sorry, it's in here somewhere. Willie muttered. Noodle stepped a laugh. Yeah, don't you worry, Mr. Wonka. Mrs. Scrubbin says, I can see you're a man of great ingenuity, and we've got to think for you. The entrepreneurial package. The room's one sorry enough. But you don't have to pay until sets tomorrow. That give you enough that'll give you long enough to earn a few pennies. More than enough, Mrs. Scrubbit, Willie said, beaming. Thank you. Mrs. Scrubbit lips curled in a sneaky smile. She held out a pen and a conjure, and just sign here. It's as easy as that. Willie heard a small cough and turned to see Noodle peering through the hats to the back room. Her eyes wet. She pointed frantically at the contract, grabbed her neck as if she were choking, then dramatically slumped over as if she had died. Willie frowned, unable to decipher what she meant. If he ate the contract, he choked to death? Willie knew that already. Read the small print, Noodle hissed. Pardon, Willie said. Mrs. Scrubber whipped around and shot Noodle viciously. Thank you, Noodle, that'll be all. And with that, she slammed the hatch shut. What was she saying, Willie asked. Who's that, then? Mrs. Scrubbit said, her voice high and awkward. The girl, Willie clarified. What girl, Mrs. Scrubbit said. It sounded like red, the small print, and there's a lot of... Willie let the squirrel-like conjured unravel and unfurled out across the entire length of the room. Oh, you don't want to listen to her, Miss, Mr. Wonka. She was put down a laundry chute when she was a baby. I took her in out of the goodness of my heart, and I've done my best, Mrs. Scrubbit explained. But it's left her with a suspicious nature. She sees conspiracy everywhere. Poor girl, Willie said sadly. These are all your standard T's and C's, and you're welcome to take a look, Mrs. Scrubbit said, fortunate crew. All right, then, Willie said. I'll give it a once over. Mrs. Scrubbit glanced nervously at Bleacher as Willie read the small print. Carefully, Bleacher pulled a bludgeon from his inside pipe and began creeping up behind Willie. Okay, that's... Uh, huh, Willie mumbled, running his parents across. Good, uh, I like what you've done there. Bleacher slowly raised the bludgeon over Willie's head. All right, all right, uh-huh, all right. Well, that seems to be in order, Willie said. Bleacher quickly pocketed the bludgeon as with a flourish. Willie signed the contract. He looked at Mrs. Scrubbit, who was as confused as Tim. Oh, Mrs. Scrubbit finally said, unable to suppress her surprise any longer. Well, in that case, welcome to Scrubbit, Mr. Wonka. There was an excited skip in her step. She led Willie up to up a rickety staircase to his room. There were photos of Tillows and a big purse that read, Come for the night, stay forever, decorating the walls. It's only charming, Mrs. Scrubbit, Willie said. I hope you'll be very comfortable here, Mr. Wonka, she said with a grin. They reached the topmost room, and when she opened the door, Willie gra gasped. The bed was plump and a four-poster, and there was even a mint on the pillow. A warming fire crackled on the hearth, and from up there, Willie could see all the dawns of the gallery's gourmet glinting in the moonlight. Sleep well, Mr. Wonka, Mrs. Scrubbit whispered. As soon as... As soon as the door closed, she turned sharply on her heel and called sweetly, Oh, Noodle! Noodle! But while her voice was his charming melody, her face was growing redder and more furious by the second. Her eyes were bulging and bloodshot, and it was clear that she was ready to explode. Noodle peeked around the corner. Yes, Mrs. Scrubbit? She chimed. 
With her face fell the second she caught sight of the raging woman, it was enough to make her little legs shake. Mrs. Scrubber charged, grabbing Noodle by the ear and with a painful pinch. Then she dragged her screaming along the corridor all the way to the far end and kicked open the heavy door. Beyond it was a freezing, frosty, flapping pigeon coat. No, Noodle squeaked. No, Mrs. Scrub. No, Mrs. Scrub. mimicked with a snort. Her furious hand worked fast, shoving Noodle head first toward the wild birds and slamming the door shut. Noodle frantically scraped at the splintered door, her little fingers slipping through the thick pigeon mess that covered every surface. She hated it in the coop, and she hated the smell most of all. It was musty and sour and hideous and hideously warm at all at once, and it never failed to make her wretch. You ever interfere in my business again? You'll be in that coop all week, understand? Mrs. Scrubbit growled from beyond the door. Yes, Mrs. Scrubbit, Noodle cried. Sorry, Mrs. Scrubbit. She tucked her knees up under her chin and shivered as the night closed in. There was not another soul in the city with a life more desperate than poor Noodle. We will take a quick break and we will continue with more right after the short timeout. All right. Chapter 3. Hover chops. The next morning, Willie returned to the Gallery's Gourmet. Ladies and gentlemen of the Gallery Gourmet, he cried. People stopped and stared as Willie thrust his cane against the floor. But when he let go, amazingly, the cane didn't fall. Instead, it stayed perfectly upright, as if it were being held there by magic. People began whispering excitedly, and the cluster of customers around him started to multiply. Delighted, yet unsurprised, by the odd re response, Willie crept to the knuckles, and then the floor is pressed a button on, on the side of the cane. A painfully sounded mechanical work <laughs> emerged from inside, and a flag began unfurling from the top of it very slowly and with great difficulty. The crowd inched closer to see more. Willie began wrestling with the flag. Imagine the flag bursting from the cane with a bang, he told the customer. People began to leave. Aha! Willie called, getting their attention. There it is. He pressed the creases out of the flag, revealing that there was a logo emblazoned on it. M Embroider W. The little letter glanced so brightly and curved so pleasantly, it drew the crowd in once more. It was at that moment Noodle happened to be passing, huffing and puffing, and dragging a laundry car at least ten times her side. She stopped to watch. This should be good, she whispered sarcastically. Willie cleared his throat. <clears throat> My name is Willie Walker, he said, and I have come to show you a marvelous morsel, an incredible edible and unbeatable eatable so quiet up and listen down. He paused. No, scratch that. Reverse it. Neil rolled her eyes. I give you, he said, my hover chalk. He pulled a jar from his hat and held it aloft. His hands shaking so much the chocolates inside were rattling. They were colored a blonde and yellow with a green case and split like wings and patterned with red spots. They looked more like magnificent insects than chocolate. That's chocolate, somebody from the crowd heckled with microscopic hover lights. Eggs inside Willie chimed in response. Fly a chocolate? Who is this guy? Someone in the crowd cried. Everyone was whispering now, and the place was electric with excitement. But above the chocolate but, but above the shopping floors where the owners of the chocolate shops had their offices, it was deadly silent. Three figures had gathered at their office windows to watch the commotion below. Willie hadn't noticed them. If he had, he would have known instantly who they were. In fact, the whole world knew who they were, because most people had their chocolate every day. Slugworth, Bickle, Gruber, and Pride Notes. Three gay chocolate. And when the ace has, Willie went on as he popped off the lid of the jar. That's when the fun began. The smell hit the crowd first, and there was a chorus of hmm, as everyone inhaled the delicious scent. But then something particular happened, something that no one had ever seen happen before. Three little chocolate roses rose up out of the jar and over themselves and hovered in the air. Everyone gasped. <gasps> up above, the three famous chocolatiers began to sweat. Slugworth turned immediately to his secretary. Miss Bonbon, he said, call the police. Back down below, Willie beamed as the customers hung on his every word. It was going better than he had ever imagined. Lots of them were licking their lips, but no one could take their eyes off the chocolates hanging in the air. 
When he thought of his mother, of how proud she would be at that month, he felt a lump rising in his throat. Is it chocolate? A small child shouted. Newell chuckled. <laughs> Willie held out the jar. Of course it's chocolate. Now who wants to taste? Well, the crowd went wild at that. There were screams and yelps. The people began pulling and pushing, desperate to take a bite. But before Willie could distribute even one of the chocolates, a commanding voice made him stop down his throat. I'll have a hover chalk. Willie Turner was delighted to see none other than Arthur Slugworth standing behind him. He knew the famous face very well. He seen a photo of him once in a newspaper and it committed him to memory. Slugworth was always there in his dreams of the future pat on the back. Welcome to the world of chocolate. He was bigger in the flesh, impressive and expensive, and expensive clad in a fine suit with glittering gold thread in. He once heard that Slugworth always wore a suit, even as pajamas. That's how professional he was. Mr. Slugworth, he said with about what an honor. Ever since I was a little boy, Willie Slugworth grabbed his hand, pumped in and up, and down in a bone-crushing handshake. Willie winced as two more chocolate legends fought their way through the crowd. Wow, Willie said. That's quite a handshake, Mr. Slugworth. It's a business handshake. Let's people know I mean business. Now, come on. He tapped his watch impatiently. Tick-tock, tick-tock. Get on with all this. Willie noticed the man's watch had stopped and was going to tell Slugger that it seemed to be having some trouble with the time. A fickle grower and proud nose arrival distracted him. They loomed over him, not saying a word. The chocolate trinity here in the flesh, Willie exclaimed. But still, they said nothing. Fickle grower was tall and spinally, using a ha handkerchief to wipe his hands. I touched a few horrible jackets that came through the crowd. He eventually muttered a proud nose to proud nose by way of explanation. Proud nose would stand it stiffly as he had been ordered to do so. He was short and squat and wore a more colorful suit than the others. A mustard tartan two-piece, his toupee was spread flat on his round head with a professional level of slicken. It was rumored that the toupee was made from the hair of his late cat, and Willie found himself staring at it. In many ways, it was like me and four famous people. He had heard a lot about the cat wig, and most people agreed the cat wore it better. Hurry up, boy, Slugworth boom. Let's try one of these so-called hover shots. Then, Willie stepped aside. And Slugworth, Fickle Grew, and Perognos pushed past, even plucking a floating chocolate out of the air. One after the other, they popped the chocolate into their mouth, and one after the other, their faces lit up with exquisite pleasure. Oh, oh, it's not just chocolate, is it? Slugworth said, unable to hide how much he was enjoying it. There's marshmallow. That's right, Willie said, beaming harvesting from the mall marshes of Peru. And caramel fickle, Gruber. But it's salted, Willie said, with a knowing nod, with the bittersweet tears of a rushing clam. Prada began drooling with his delight. And is that surely not cherry? Cherry blossom, Willie corrected him. Cherry pet by the pick of the cherry pickers in the Imperial Guardians of Japan. As they swallowed, the chocolatiers shot each other's worried glances. Well, Mr. Wonka, Slugworth said, I have to hand it to you. I've been in this business a long time, and I can safely say that all of the chocolate I've ever tasted, this is with a doubt, the absolute 100%. Willie finally swallowed Newell in the crowd gave, and gave her a thumbs up. Worse, Slugger finished. Why, thank you. That's very... Wait, what? Willie cried. Slugger shook his head gravely. We three are the fiercest of rivals, but we agree on one thing. A good chocolate should be simple, plain, and uncomplicated. Whereas this, with all its bells and whistles, pickle grew or wrinkled his nose. Well, it's just weird, Prano said. Willie slumped. He stared out the captivated crowd, feeling the stain of staring eyes. Don't be downhearted, Mr. Wonka, Slugworth said, stifling his work. So you're not a chocolatier. There are many other lines of business. Although I avoid fashion, Fickle River snorted. A giggle ripped through the crowd. Willie looked down at his trusty plum colored coat, and suddenly he remembered something. His spirits lifted, a mischievous twinkle crossing his eye. Well, there's one more thing that might change your minds, he said. I don't know. If you thought the taste of my chocolate was weird, you might not like this next bit. 
Right on cue, Slugworth's feet le left the ground and was raising toward the ceiling. His hands were grabbing at air, searching desperately for something to hold on to. But he kept going up and up. Wonka! He bellowed. Willie turned to the crowd and said in his most teacherly tone, The hoverfly is booking out of its chocolate cocoon and it's flapping its wings like a hummingbird. Nuts, Flicko Groover, left the ground and then Prod knows. You mean the fly's doing this? Prod knows screamed. Oh, yes, Willie said. But don't worry, it'll be completely unharmed. In about 20 minutes, it'll get tired and exit through your rear. Your what? Flicko Groover yelled. He means we're going to fight them out of our bond, Prod knows clarified before slipping over backward and sending his wig falling to the ground. Willie picked it up. As he did so, he noticed something curious scrolled inside three numbers. Give me that, Prod knows growled. And Willie hastily threw it back to him. The flowing chocolatier caught it and put it back on his head, holding it firmly in place. This time, so gravity couldn't steal it again. You're after Walker Wonka, Slugger said. Who in their right mind would want a chocolate that makes you fly? Who? Who? Willie mused. Let's find out, shall we? Who's for a hover chalk? At that, the crowd lunges one, and has a huge hysterical mass of bodies out and outstretched arms, all aimed at the jar. There were screams of delight as Willie pressed chocolates into their hands, and then and they and they in turn dropped coins into his pocket. He stood back to behold the marvelous sight. One by one, they rose upward. More and more of them went up until the great glass dome was plastered with a canopy of delighted customers. A woman in feathered hat flew past with her dog trying to on its leash behind her. Flowed, followed by a squealing nun during doing somersaults. An old man glided along, hands outstretched, laughingly so hardly he was rain in tears. Willie stood beneath them, flicking a finger back and forth as if he were conducting an orchestra, his face all lit with fun and laughter. All right, folks, came, came a shout from my eyes. <sighs> Willie tried to see the police fill in. Nothing to see here, boom, the man at the front, the big boss, the chief of police. He was decorated with metal and muscles and had tall leather boots that squeaked as he moved. All arrogant swagger and chest puffed out, he had a fine mustache, which as he got closer, Willie could see was adorned with little chunks of chocolate. Just a small group of people defying the laws of gravity, the chief said, Look on, boys. Officers began pl pl pulling the flowing customers back down there like plucking stray balloons from the sky. Then a familiar face approached Willie, the police officer from the day before. I'm not daydreaming this time, Willie said. I'm no rule breaking here. I'm afraid we've had complaints about you, sir, the police officer said. Complaints, Willie paused, waiting for the man's name. Officer Aff Affable, he said. And yes, complaints that you're disrupting the trade of other businesses. I'm regretfully obliged to move you on and confiscate your earnings. The chief nodded to another officer and marched forward and pulled the coins from Willie's pocket. Wait. Oh, no. Please, Willie cried. Don't worry, it's going to be a good, going to a good cause. Sick kids or something, the chief shouted over. I'm sorry, Mr. Wonka, Officer Absible said. Rules is rules. At least leave me a sovereign, Willie pleaded. I need it to pay for my room. Officer Absible glanced over his shoulder, checked the chief was looking, and then Willie sl then slipped Willie a single sovereign from his own pocket. He said, then he lowered his voice to a whisper. Now take my advice and sell your job elsewhere. All right, so this video, because this story is very long, we are going to read three chapters a day. So tomorrow will be chapter four.